everybody that I talked to said the same thing. Even on a low dose of mint, testicles pretty much disappear. Let's start comparing Dicadurbolin to Parabolin to mint, starting with the esters. Now, Nandrolone comes in two medical esters, being Nandrolone decanoate containing 64% Nandrolone being the active pharmaceutical ingredient. So if you inject Nandrolone decanoate, Dicadurbolin at any dose, you're only getting 64% of that milligram dose that you're injecting in the form of its active pharmaceutical ingredient being Nandrolone. Nandrolone phenylpropionate contains 67.5% nandrolone. Now, parabolin, right, its medical ester was trembolone hexahydrobenzyl carbonate, containing 65.9% trembolone. But the underground labs also produce other formulations of trembolone, one of them being trembolone suspension, containing 100% trembolone. Now, the post-injection pain might already not make trembolone suspension worth it in the long run because you're Right, you're going to be uh, covered in lumps and bumps right, due to the inflammation at the injection site. The most uh, popular trembolone formulation is trembolone acetate, containing 86.5% actual trembolone. And then there's also trembolone enanthate, containing 70.7% trembolone. Now, most of the bodybuilders, the experienced bodybuilders, would tell people to avoid trembolone enanthate and just stick with daily administrations of trembolone acetate. Also avoid trembolone uh, hexahydrobenzyl carbonate, being the parabolin, right? Even though some guys prefer the parabolin, but there must be some uh, paraphernalia involved, right? Be because uh, right, the old school bodybuilders used uh, two amps of parabolin per week. That's what I'm going to run. And now I'm old school, right? My brothers. Still, most bodybuilders would prefer to run trembolone acetates with daily administrations to keep serum concentrations as stable as possible and mitigate some of the side effects which come along with trembolone use. And again, if there's intolerable side effects or you need to alter the dose rapidly, then you can either discontinue or increase the dose of trembolone acetate and serum concentrations will rise or fall quite rapidly. Whereas with trembolone enanthate or the hexahydrobenzyl carbonate ester in parabolin, it might take a couple weeks, right? So most people tend to avoid those compounds, but some people with a lot of experience running trembolone might even prefer the parabolin or the enanthate esters. Mint, never approved as a pharmaceutical. Again, the undercount ester available is tristolone acetate, containing 87.3% tristolone. I believe there's also a tristolone enanthate, but I was not able to pinpoint the price. So I'm going to leave that out of this equation. Again, most of the sources that have mint list tristolone acetate. Now, there's two videos that I produced previously that might be interesting for you to watch, comparing the active pharmaceutical ingredient contained within the ester and how many, how much bang for your buck you would get for one milliliter injection. So if you haven't watched that video, you can watch that here. And I've also made another price comparison video in this context, where I compare the active pharmaceutical ingredient to how much money you're going to spend. You can watch that video here. So I briefly want to rank these esters according to their one milliliter injection volume, right? So for each one milliliter that you inject, Nandrolone decanoate at 250 milligrams per one milliliter will yield 160 milligrams actual Nandrolone. So that means that you get the most amount of milligrams of a 19 nor testosterone derivative with a high progestogenic activity. Nandrolone decanoate will give you the most amount of activity on the androgen receptor and the progesterone receptor for a one milliliter injection. Second on this list is Trimblone Enanthate. At 200 milligrams for one milliliter, you will get 141.4 milligrams actual Trimblone for a one milliliter injection. Tristolone Acetate is third at 100 milligrams per one milliliter. Again, some of the underground labs produce Tristolone Acetate at 50 milligrams per one milliliter, but we're going to use the 100 milligram per one milliliter concentration in this comparison you'll get 87.3 milligrams actual tristolone. Fourth on the list is trimbolone acetate. 100 milligrams per one milliliter yields exactly 86.5 milligrams actual trimbolone. And it means for one milliliter of mint, you get 0.8 milligrams more steroids than one milliliter of trin ace. So bang for your buck wise, maybe mint is already winning. 
Nandrolone phenylpropionate, fifth on the list, 100 milligrams for one milliliter, yields 67.5 milligrams actual nandrolone. Sixth on the list is underground lab trembolone hexahydrobenzyl carbonate. At 100 milligrams per one milliliter, you get exactly 65.9 milligrams actual trembolone. Seventh is trembolone suspension. So even though trembolone suspension is a 100% active pharmaceutical ingredient, since the concentration is only 50 milligrams per one milliliter, you only get 50 milligrams trembolone. So that's very low on this list. But what's even lower is Negma Laboratories Parabolin. Parabolin contains 67 milligrams per one half milliliter ampule. So that means one milliliter yields 33.3 milligrams actual trembolone, right? One ampule of parabolin contained 50 milligrams of trembolone, but it's for 1.5 milliliters. So if you want one milliliter of parabolin, you only get 33.3 milligrams actual trembolone. Maybe it's not even worth the injection volume, especially considering that a one milliliter nandrolone decanoate administration yields five times, five times guys, five times more anabolic androgenic steroids over a one milliliter injection of parabolin, right? So maybe parabolin in this comparison is last on this list. Let's move on to the molecular weight and the molar mass of these three compounds so we can make a head on head comparison and get the exact same amount of molecules so we can compare these compounds fairly, right? Molecule for molecule, not milligram for milligram. Now the molecular weight and the molar mass I'll put on the screen so I don't have to repeat that for you guys. It is of note that mint is about 5.9% heavier compared to the mean of the molecular weight of nandrolone and trimbolone. So again, mint is slightly heavier, affecting its dosing protocol. So in this comparison, we'll use the Avocados constant to get one thousandth of a mole being 6.0221476 times 10 to the power 20 molecules of either nandrolone, trimbolone, or trestolone, right? That's 602.21476 quintillion molecules. Man, that's a lot of steroid molecules. So based on the molecular weight, to get the exact same amount of molecules, being 602.2 quintillion molecules, we would need 428.76 milligrams decadurabolin, nandrolone decanoate, and then a concentration of 250 milligrams per one milliliter to get this exact dose, right? 602.2 quintillion nandrolone molecules, we would need to inject 1.72 milliliters. Now, based on a little bit of cost average of the underground market, that administration of 1.72 milliliters would cost about $10.90. Now, if you do this exact same calculation for Trembolone, and we're going to compare Parabolin to Trenace, to get 602.2 quintillion Trembolone molecules, we would need to administer 410.28 milligrams Parabolin, right? Trembolone hexahydrobenzyl carbonate. Now this comes in two versions. We have the underground parabolin at 100 milligrams per one milliliter, which means we only need 4.1 milliliter of this underground uh, parabolin at a higher concentration. But if you were to have a time machine laying around and you would go back in time and purchase some sweet Negma Laboratories parabolin amps, you would need to administer 8.1 milliliter of these old school parabolin amps because the concentration is so much lower compared to underground lab parabolin, which is produced nowadays. So that means 4.1 milliliters of underground lab parabolin versus 8.1 milliliters of Negma Laboratories parabolin, which again is no longer around. Now, most people nowadays would favor trimbolone acetate over trimbolone hexahydrobenzyl carbonate. And in that case, to get 602.2 quintillion trimbolone molecules from trimbolone acetate, you would only need 312.57 milligrams and inject 3.1 milliliters. So again, when we do a cost comparison to get the exact same amount of molecules, you would need to spend $40.30 on underground labs parabolin versus $20.95 on underground trembolone acetate for the exact same amount of trembolone molecules. That's insane. Again, still, Nandrolone at about $11, but you would need to spend four times as much on underground lab parabolin priced at over $40. Again, same amount of molecules, albeit that the pharmacodynamics and results are going to be uh, different, obviously, between Nandrolone and Trembolone. Still, the price discrepancy is uh, very substantial. 
Let's move over to mint. If you want 602.2 quintillion molecules of tristolone coming from tristolone acetate, you would need to dose that at 330.35 milligrams of mint. Now, if you were to go with 100 milligrams per one milliliter mint, you would need to administer 3.3 milliliters. But if you can only find 50 milligrams per one milliliter of mint, you would have to double the injection volume at 6.6 .6 milliliters. So that's quite substantial also. Now, I was able to do a price comparison for 100 milligrams per one milliliter of mint, which is quite pricey. Usually vials are about $100 on average. So that means that 602.2 quintillion tristolone molecules will sit you back $34.80. So when we do a quick price ranking, you can see that Parabolin is certainly the most expensive for the same amount of molecules, followed by Mint, followed by Tren Ace, and then Decadurabolin last. Seems to be the cheapest, albeit that, that the effects might not be as pronounced on a molecule for molecule basis compared to Trimbolone or Tristolone. Let's briefly discuss the anabolic to androgenic ratio of these compounds. Nandrolone has an anabolic rating of 125 and an androgenic rating of 37. Trimbolone is an anabolic and androgenic rating of 500. And Tristolone comes in at a whopping anabolic rating of 2,300 and an androgenic rating of 650. Wow. I don't think that plays out in the real world at all, especially considering that there are several studies indicating that Tristolone is supposedly prostate safe. But the androgenic rating is based on prostate enlargement. Right? So... Again, I'll make a separate video kind of debunking the anabolic to androgenic rating. It's a little bit of an outdated metric, even though it's scientific evidence. I think this has to be uh, re-examined in the near future, which I don't think will ever take place because, well, those uh, studies are quite lengthy and cost a lot of money. And who would they benefit besides the bodybuilding community, right? Again, these are just number on paper. There's an individual response. There's a dose-dependent response. And, well, anab anabolism isn't only driven by anabolic steroids, right? Anabolism can come through many different pathways, which I already made a video about. And keep in mind that prostate and prostate enlargement and prostate issues, prostate cancer, for example, might also be caused by estradiol. So again, it's a little bit of an outdated metric, still scientific evidence. I thought I'd mention it. Now, luckily, compared to all of the other comparisons which we did in the past, the relative binding affinities of these three different compounds is known. So the relative binding affinity to the androgen receptor compared to testosterone of nandrolone is 154 to 155, of trembolone is 190 to 197, so almost two times the binding affinity of testosterone, and ment has a relative binding affinity for the androgen receptor compared to testosterone of 100 to 125. For the progesterone receptor compared to progesterone itself, nandrolone has a relative binding affinity of 20, Trembolone 74 to 75, and Trestolone 50 to 75. Now for the estrogen alpha and beta receptors, there's very low affinity. The relative binding affinity of Trembolone to the glucocorticoid receptor compared to dexamethasone is 2.9, whereas the other two relative binding affinities are relatively low. For the mineral corticoid receptor compared to aldosterone, the binding affinity of nandrolone is 1.6, and the relative binding affinity of trembolone is 1.33, whereas the binding affinity of tristolone is unknown. The binding affinity for the sex hormone binding globulin compared to dihydrotestosterone of nandrolone is 1 to 16, of trembolone is unknown, and of tristolone is 12. So it's certainly much lower compared to most of the dihydrotestosterone derivatives like uh, provirin or uh, drostanolone or primabolin, for example, right? Those will lower your sex hormone binding globulin levels considerably more than 19 nor testosterone derivatives. And it finally brings us to the head-on-head -head comparison of these three compounds. And again, guys, I'm very sorry that I don't have hands-on experience with Trestolone myself. I'm purely going from anecdotal reports of clients, people that I talk to, people that I highly respect, and what I was able to piece together online. I have experimented with Trembolone and uh, vouched to never use it again. I have experimented with nandrolone and I don't see a reason to ever use it again because I get some joint release from Primabolin use. So again, it might not be the best comparison, but I'm still going to do my best. Regarding the clinical data, the most information we have at this time and probably for the foreseeable future 
is for DECA Durabolin. Again, it is FDA approved, it is prescribed, it is used in medical treatments up until today. Parabolin has been discontinued, MENT was never FDA approved and introduced into the medical field. So from the clinical evidence, you can find a lot on Nandrolone and DECA Durabolin, a little bit on Trembolone and uh, well, almost non-existent medical literature on MENT. There might be maybe 30 papers in total. When it comes to acne, I would say that Decadurabolin or Nandrolone seems to be the worst on acne formation. Could be because Nandrolone is typically used during the off season when the diet is a little bit more lax and caloric intake is generally higher. And it could also be because Decadurabolin and Nandrolone promotes the conversion of testosterone into estradiol, which causes either hormonal fluctuations, which contribute to acne formation, or just generally rises your estradiol much more compared to a contest prep where Trembolone or even mint is generally deployed. And again, when you're in a contest prep or cutting phase, the diet is lower calories and more restricted regarding the food choices. So you might have um, nandrolone, cheese, and dairy, right? And hormonal fluctuations because, well, it's a long ester, so you inject it twice a week. So you have this roller coaster of hormones throughout the week. And then if you do daily administrations of Trembolone and mint and there's no cheese or dairy or chocolate in the picture because you're, well, prepping. Um, right? It's a little bit of a different scenario, but from all the anecdotal reports and my personal use, I would say that Decadur Bolin certainly is worse for acne formation. And the same can be said for gyno, right? Decadur Bolin does promote the conversion of testosterone into estradiol, which uh, seems to be the primary driver of gynecomastia formation. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't get gyno on Trembolone or even mint for that matter, all three are progestogenic 19 nors. So if you don't control your estrogen, right, which nandrolone can certainly exacerbate, if you have high estrogen, a compound that potentiates effects through the progesterone receptor, not only in uh, the gynecomastia breast tissue, but also in the pituitary gland, increasing prolactin secretion, that's a recipe for gyno, right? So a little bit of caution is advised. All three of these compounds could potentiate gynecomastia formation if estrogen is high because you have a testosterone base and you're not managing your estrogen accordingly, and Trembolone and Trestolone are certainly potent enough to exacerbate whatever small amount of gynecomastia tissue has already formed. And again, if serum estrogen levels are a little bit high, maybe you're smoking a little bit of wheat, which also increases prolactin secretion, right? Again, it's a recipe for disaster. So again, caution is advised. When it comes to hair loss, anecdotal reports would say that Parabolin is the worst on hair loss. Now, if you were to use a testosterone base with all of these three compounds, you don't minimize the potential for dihydrotestosterone conversion, which you probably shouldn't do when you're combining testosterone with nandrolone because, well, the nandrolone might be worse on your hairline than the dihydronandrolone that is being converted through 5-alpha reductase activity. So that's a little bit of circumstantial use. Again, if there's a testosterone base, you're doing your daily administrations, whether that's Nandrolone, Trembolone, or Tristolone. I would say that Trembolone is worst on the hairline, and mint might follow a close second. Again, there's not so many anecdotal reports on mint, and mint is generally used by more advanced bodybuilders who either don't care about their hairline, have kind of given up on that whole uh, thing, right? Mint is not used by recreational hormone replacement therapy guys. Like, uh, I'm doing TRT+, plus and mint is on top, right? The first option would probably be nandrolone or maybe primabolin or masterone, which also induce a hair loss by themselves. So I would say that well, it's hard to compare. Trembolone or Trestolone are both not hair safe. And the only circumstance where nandrolone is hair safe is when there's no testosterone base or no dihydrotestosterone derivatives in the picture. Regarding lower back pumps and shin splints, I would say parabolin is the worst. If you haven't watched this video, you should watch it before considering to add Trembolone to your stack. Insomnia and night sweats. Trembolone hands down wins in that department, right? If you're looking for insomnia or night sweats, you gotta get on that Trembolone sandwich. Azospermia, right? Complete infertility, where you do your semen analysis and the picture comes back zero, zero, and we're not able to determine the morphology <laughs> or all that other stuff because there's no spermatosa in your semen, right? Complete azospermia mint. Again, that's from the clinical evidence. Mint has been investigated as a birth control method for men. And there's several, actual several studies that show that mint induces complete azospermia, 
within six to 12 months. Now on Trimbalone, right? I've seen anecdotal reports of people running Trimbalone with ACG, still azoospermic, right? <laughs> Nothing in the semen, but that can be said for testosterone. And personally, and many of my clients, they still produce decent amount of semen when you're just running testosterone or a dihydrotestosterone on top. So a combination of test and primo, for example, or test and mastrone does not always result in azoospermia, especially when ACG is used to sustain testicular function. But you use test and mastrone and trimbolone, or test and ment, or test uh, and nandrolone, most people will experience azoospermia, even if they use ACG. So keep that in mind, the progestogenic uh, activity resulting in uh, loss of fertility is very substantial. And it's further confirmed by the vast array of anecdotal reports regarding testicular atrophy, even on a therapeutic dose of nandrolone or low dose, like a conservative off-season dose of 50 milligrams trembolone or maybe 50 milligrams of uh, tristolone during off-season, testicular atrophy, yeah, not so pleasant to the point the testicles shoot into the body and you have to push them out multiple times per day. I've heard this from several clients. I experienced this myself when I was running nandrolone, even at conservative dosages or trembolone at conservative dosages. Um, testicular atrophy is a real deal. And even with ACG, it seems to not respond that well. Again, that's why I made that video in the past discussing if ACG was even beneficial in cycle. Because when you run progestogenic 19 nors, the nandrolone, the trembolone, or trestolone, it seems that ACG is not really effective. And increasing the dose, counterintuitively, increasing the dose of ACG will shrink the testicles even more, which could come from desensitization or complete downregulation of the luteinizing hormone and chorionic gonadotropin receptor, right? At which the LH or ACG acts. So again, keep that in mind. Testicular atrophy seems to be across the boards, but based on anecdotal reports, um, talking to people, MENT uh, apparently shrinks the testicles most. So that's not something I'm looking forward to if I were to ever experiment with this compound. Everybody that I talked to said the same thing. Even on a low dose of MENT, testicles pretty much disappear, right? Of course, it will come back if you do a proper pulse cycle therapy and you give your body some time to let these compounds clear before you start the ACG and um, Novadex and Clomid. But when it comes to PCT, pulse cycle therapy, the inhibitory effect of a successful outcome of your PCT, decadurabolin is surely the worst. And it's probably because it stays active in the system for such a long time, right? The detection time of nandrolone decanoate is 18 months. And it doesn't mean you're shut down for 18 months after your last decadurabolin injection. It just means that the metabolites are present, but it hasn't been investigated if those metabolites have a downregulatory and negative feedback on your HPTA over its active pharmaceutical ingredient being, uh, right, the parent hormone being nandrolone. Still, the active life of nandrolone decanoate, trembolone hexahydrobenzocarbonate is uh, quite substantial. So you might need to do a testosterone replacement therapy bridge before you're even ready to start your pulse cycle therapy, right? Allow of all of these metabolites or the trembolone and the nandrolone to clear from your system. Now there's no suppressive and progestogenic activity in the hypothalamus and the pituitary reducing LH and FSH secretion it seems to be the worst by decadurabolin. And I've heard guys not being able to do PCT for a year, a whole year after their last decadurabolin injection. So they would come off, they do the cookie cutter PCT two weeks after their last injection of uh, natural on decanoate. That one is unsuccessful. Then they do another PCT, maybe four months down the line. That one is also unsuccessful. They go back on hormone replacement therapy for a couple months. Then they try again, right? This is all in the context of getting their wife pregnant. And then finally, at the third PCT, they uh, recover some testicular function, right? Because the nandrolone metabolites were in their system suppressing proper testicular function, right? Yeah, a nightmare. Talking about nightmare mental changes. Trembolone, certainly the worst. Right? We don't have to say too much about this. I'm, I'm sure everybody can agree. I can't find many anecdotal reports on mint altering your mood and causing this trend rage to the point uh, that uh, Trembolone can do. So I would say the mental changes on Trembolone are certainly the worst. But I also have to mention that on a low and effective dose of 50 to 75 milligrams of Trembolone per week, 
some people actually notice a mood and right a positive aggression boost. So it's a very low effective dose to get you in the zone. But personally, I would prefer to use a prima bolin for that right, to get you in a like a little bit of a dihydrotestosterone aggravation scenario where you have positive aggression for the workouts, positive aggression for business, but it doesn't overlap into your personal life where you're irritated and moody and had a cloudy rain cloud over your head uh, raining on you 24-7, which was certainly the case for me when I ran it in the past. Hematocrit changes, a little bit difficult to determine. Again, nandrolone and trembolone in particular conditions might have been prescribed for anemia. Um, from everything that I've seen, all the blood work that I've seen, I would say that parabol and trembolone is worse on hematocrit increases compared to nandrolone. But man, there's so many compounding factors in that. Um, it's a little bit hard to pinpoint, right? And I've seen blood work on nandrolone only where hematocrit went up. So it, maybe it's just individual response. Blood pressure. During the off-season, I would say decadurabolin due to its potential for mineral retention. And at prep, right? Contest prep at higher dosages. Men seems to be the worst for blood pressure. So during the off-season, you might be able to mitigate some of the blood pressure increases from decadurabolin with a blood pressure medication or altering your electrolyte intake and making sure that it stays consistent and your hydration is consistent as well. You should be able to level and balance out your blood pressure issues. But with men, for some guys, there's no way around it. And then they have to triple dip into the nabivalol, the telmersartan, and the Cialis, all at pretty high dosages, right? 5 milligrams of Bivol, 40 milligrams Telmersartan, and then 10 milligrams Cialis on top, just to keep the blood pressure in range. Now, for the people that I've talked to, they said it was highly worth it, right? Regarding all its benefits. So, oh, all I have to do is manage my blood pressure. Still, we don't know over time how much of a negative effect that might have on your kidneys. And since the medical literature is not as extensive compared to Trembolone or Nandrolone or most of the other compounds which have been tried and proven, um, right? Time will tell if they turn out to be kidney toxic simply due to the increase of blood pressure, which remains poorly managed for years to decades due to the inexperience or mismanagement of the user of mint. Estrogenic activity. Well, something of note is that nandrolone, again, promoting the conversion of testosterone into estradiol, results in higher 17 beta estradiol concentrations. Whereas with trembolone, it seems that it has no positive or negative effect on your serum estradiol levels, assuming that testosterone forms the base. So in some cases, you see that trembolone reduces estradiol concentrations slightly, maybe 5%, 10%. It's not something um, commonly accepted that trembolone reduces your estradiol concentrations. There might be something to be said for trembolone taking the place of testosterone in aromatized enzymes, preventing the conversion of testosterone into estradiol to a certain extent, similarly to how primabol and masterone, boldenone or boldenone metabolites seem to inhibit testosterone to estradiol conversion by blocking the aromatized enzymes temporarily, right? Being a reversely binding aromatized inhibitor, sort of say. So there's something to be said for trimbolone in that capacity. Again, but you don't, won't see the dramatic reduction in serum estradiol uh, concentrations compared to some of the dihydrotestosterone derivatives. Now with mint, it's a little bit of a different story, which does potentiate some estrogenic activity. Mint aromatizes into 7-alpha methyl estradiol, which shouldn't be mistaken with what Dianabol converts into being 17-alpha methyl estradiol. Now, both the 7-alpha and the 17-alpha methyl estradiol versions, we're not exactly sure if they can fulfill the exact same physiological functions as estradiol does, right? Being aromatized from testosterone. So if you were to use mint as a base, besides the fact that 7-alpha methyl estradiol doesn't exactly detect as estradiol in your blood work parameter, so your estradiol will be um, pretty low if you don't have a testosterone base, or you don't put something else in place to sustain testicular function or get some neurosteroid conversion, right? I already mentioned uh, which options you have as a base compound in this video. I didn't mention mint because, again, I don't have any experience with mint and I'm not exactly sure if a mint base instead of testosterone base would be worth it regarding the changes in blood work parameters. So again, I'm not really sure if the estradiol and the estrogenic activity meant by itself 
or mint in combination with testosterone base in these dosages that we're comparing um, would yield in more progestogenic activity or slightly less. Still, for now, I would say that estrogenic activity, comparing the dosages, I would say that decadurabolin is certainly the worst. Regarding progestogenic activity, parabolin is the worst, which is actually a benefit. Again, if you can mitigate some of the gynecomastia, which seems to be more common with nandrolone, then this progestogenic activity of parabolin, trembolone, is highly anabolic. Is highly anabolic. Now, people who have a lot of experience with mint would say that mint has better progesterogenic activity when it comes to anabolism. I can't really confirm that. Again, we're going by anecdotal reports. Um, I've experimented with trembolone. I know a lot of people who um, use trembolone to great success during their contest prep. So for now, I would say that anabolism coming from progesterogenic activity, parabolin wins, but I might change my mind in the future. Worsening on lipids, parabolin as well. It seems to be worse for your lipids at any dose, right? If you're comparing uh, these three dosages for the exact same amount of molecules, I would say that parabolin certainly is the worst on your lipids. And the same for lowering the SHBG, even though the relative binding affinity for the SHBG is unknown, judging from all the blood work that I've seen, and I've also seen a little bit of blood work on Tristolone, SHBG seems to be generally the lowest on parabolin or trembolone. Let's go over the positive effects regarding vascularity. Again, considering that parabolin and trembolone is generally used during a cutting phase or contest prep, where body fat levels are very, very low, I would say that trembolone wins. Now, I've also seen some guys running mint uh, during a cutting phase or contest prep, and they're also quite vascular. Now, some guys might say that they're more vascular on mint, but again, vascularity is determined by a lot of different factors, not just the steroids that you're running, right? Um, right? Vasodilators can play a part or caloric intake, um, a lot of factors. But from my personal experience, I would say that uh, Trembolone uh, seems to be the best for vascularity. When I ran Trembolone in the past, either post-workout or following a meal, right? When I was low body fat levels, certain points of the day, I would feel veiny as a cock. Literally, spider veins everywhere, in the legs, in the quads, in the chest, in the arms, in the forehead also, and all these little micro veins um, right, surrounding your skull, not the most pleasant appearance, certainly a big deterrent for women, especially when you're training. Um, so that's something that I noticed and many of my clients noticed when they're undergoing contest prep. I'm sure some of the experienced mint users would say the same for mint. And it's definitely not something you notice with Nandrolone because of the water retention that it seems to potentiate. Cosmetic changes, Trimbalone. Again, going for my anecdotal reports of myself and all of my clients uh, running Trimbalone during contest prep. There seems to be nothing else like Trimbalone. You can grow in a caloric deficit up until you're about 5%, 6% body fat and the calories really need to come down. Then you don't really grow anymore. But man, Trimbalone in a caloric deficit, it seems to be the best thing ever if you can deal with the mental side effects. Accrual of muscle tissue. Again, it's a little bit dose dependent. So we're comparing this exact same amount of uh, molecules being 602.2 quintillion nandrolone versus trembolone versus tristolone molecules. Personally, I would say that trembolone wins. But again, some of the experienced mint users say that they don't want to go back to trembolone because they get just as good of a result with mint, albeit not with this uh, anger management or the transomnia or the night sweats or some of the side effects which are generally associated with Trembolone, especially at higher dosages. So again, from my personal experience, accrual of muscle tissue, Trembolone hands down, but I'm sure some of the experienced mint user will say, listen, it's a little bit outdated, that information, you should try it for yourself, and then you can gain some hardcore tissue without all of these anger management issues, right? And that's always something that I struggled with running Trembolone myself, that's why I discontinued this compound even though it was highly enjoyable to run train and go to the gym and have a phenomenal workout, right? The workouts on train are right, legendary. I would say every workout is a legendary workout on train alone. Uh, but the anger management uh, issues uh, for the other 22 hours of the day uh, were intolerable for me. Still, all things considering regarding the price and its effects and its medical data and everything else, right, from everything that I know, I would say that the winner is train alone. Um, but I might change my mind in the future, considering that the anecdotal reports 
of Mint are getting better and better and better. Stay tuned if I ever need to do an update video. Um, I changed my mind about Trestalone, right? For now, I'm going to uh, keep my hands off because I'm enjoying myself with Test and Primo and perhaps a little bit of Anivar on top in the future. I think I'll leave it at that. Again, the winner is Trembolone. Let me know which compound you favor most out of the progestogenic 19 nor testosterone derivatives with a lot of progestogenic activity. Let me know down below in the comment section. For now, thank you guys so much for watching. If you're looking for the most comprehensive guides to bodybuilding pharmacology, you can find the ebooks on my website, vicarsteve.com slash shop. Personalized advice always available through consultations. You can find the rates in the consultation section. Follow me on Instagram at vicarsteve. No progestogenic activity in these front double biceps, maybe in the future, but for now I'm going to leave it to the testosterone and the prima ballin. and seems to be working quite well. 600 milligrams in these cannons. Um, well, it's only been two weeks, so expect a little bit more gains going forward. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.